All right, guys, so I finally got a little bit of uh, free time here. Now, I was really surprised with the poll that, first of all, that Insidious 2 got no votes at all. That isn't as surprising, but, man, Audition and Ringu Spiral, they were really battling it out there. So, because... I'm, I'll be traveling back home uh, to Long Island tomorrow. So if I'm not too tired when I get home tomorrow is when I'll have Ringu Spiral out. It lost the poll like <laughs> by one vote. So we're getting an audition here, Takashi Miike. Now, it's been a long time since I've seen this movie. And I'm going to go against everything I believe in and always say when I say I'm not going to pronounce these people's names. But fuck it. Let's try it. We have starring... Ryo Ishibashi. <laughs> I don't know why I bowed my head like that. All right, this one is going to be... Ehai Shina. That's what it says. Tetsu Sawaki and Jun Kanimura. Those two were easy, see? It's just that, that, that Ehai one. I don't know how to pronounce that. But it's a pretty long movie, too. It's around a, almost two hours, hour and 50 minutes or something like that. Now... I talked about this a long while ago in my most viewed video on the channel, still to this day, on Cannibal Holocaust, and basically was saying how I feel in it from experience and from talking to many, many other horror fans and film fans and stuff like that, that a lot of us horror fans, especially those of us who started very early on like, I'm talking five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, like, very young. At some point, we tend to, or most of us, tend to look for, like, after we've seen all the Nightmare on Elm Streets and then Freddy and then Jason and Michael and all the classics, Child's Play and everything, we always kind of look for more, like, the more extreme movies. Like, what's the most, like bizarre warped films out there and you usually get the responses when you look for it cannibal holocaust or a serbian film or uh 120 days of, of sodom solo that movie sucks so bad and other movies like that and audition i feel is another one of those that i think that's how i first heard of it was maybe early teens late teens and seeking out those disturbing movies <laughs> <laughs> and somebody recommended to me Audition. If anyone hasn't seen Audition, a little synopsis is this man who's a TV producer, loses his wife, he has a son, and now he's widowed, and he ends up, his son is encouraging him to go out and try to find another you know, woman to date and stuff. So a very supportive kid. And he proceeds to throw an audition, pretending that it's for a role in a show, but it's really an audition for his, you know, next girlfriend or soon to be hopeful wife, like hopefully his wife or whatever. And she ends up turning out to not be that 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 good of a human being. <laughs> like one bit. But let's talk it, let's watch it, let's discuss it. It's gonna be fun. I haven't seen this in a while. Now when you first see this film, at least when I first saw it, you don't it doesn't feel like a horror movie at all. For, like, the first half of the film, it feels like a romantic comedy, which throws you off completely. <laughs> Especially if you know nothing about this film going into it. You're just going to be thinking, did I put on the right audition? Is there another movie? Like, is this the wrong one? And I think Mike is great at that with this. That it it really builds to the craziness. It really builds... And has great character development, but it builds towards the, the ending infamous scene so well, and it comes from such an innocent place and just proceeds to just get more ominous and more dark, and all right, there's something wrong with this woman. Now, Mike, I'm not super familiar with like his directing styles like i've seen ichi the killer is another great one from him uh, one miss call is another great one i might have seen another one or two from him can't think of the names off the hand off the uh, top of my head but 
it's not I'm not as well versed with him or in Japanese horror in general. I've said this like it's not my forte. I'm not huge into Japanese horror, but there are definitely a whole bunch of classics, which is why why we're going through uh, a bunch of them for the summer here. But I can't like pick out like if I'm like like I can with Fulci or Bava or Carpenter or you know, directors like that Lynch that I can be like oh that's so Fulci like that's such a Fulci shot right there or this is so Argento and so I can't pick out and be like this is so Takashi Miike like I'm not too familiar with his directing style but everything I've seen by him the direction's absolutely phenomenal so I gotta definitely verse myself with more of his stuff but. And I've said this before in one of the Japanese horror videos uh, that I did recently. If there's two things that Japanese horror cre- uh, directors and filmmakers excel at and always have, it's ghost movies and films where like a woman, a woman is just losing her mind or descending into insanity or just snaps. Both of those are, I feel like, the forte of Japanese horror. Just like pretty much every different country has their own forte, like the Italians with the giallos and stuff. That's what I feel with the ghost movies. I said this, oh, Quaden, or whatever the hell you pronounce it, when I was talking about that on the podcast. It, it's, it's, they do it so well, ghost movies. And just the way that they shoot them, the way that they just pale faces, but they make them look gorgeous at the same time is terrifying. It's just their forte. And, and it's no surprise that after The Ring blew up that uh, all the uh, other Japanese horror films that were getting remakes and everything were mostly all paranormal ghost films. Uh, yeah, so let's not butcher this. So the, the two characters, the main characters here, Shigaharu and Shigahiko? <laughs> is that right? Whatever. We're going to go with Shigaharu and Shigahiko. is father and son, respectively. And Asami, that's an easy one, is the crazy bitch. But uh, Shigaharu's wife ends up passing away. Uh, then we flash forward several years, I think six years, to the present day. And he's encouraging his father to go out and try to find, meet somebody new. He can see that his father's lonely. He can see that it's been, you know, six years, and his son is a caring son. He cares about his father, doesn't want him to be alone the rest of his life, doesn't want him to keep, you know, be lonely and held back emotionally because, you know, forever because of his wife dying. And so he's telling him to go out and find somebody new. And then he thinks of this great idea to set up a fake audition, which is not a bad idea. I'll tell you one thing about Mike's work, though, out of a few films that I mentioned that I've seen of his. I love how little cuts there are in this film. Like, just just like in the like 60s, 70s, 80s, just like static camera, let a scene play out, conversation. Like, there's no cuts all over the place. That's one thing I, I adore about this. The guy's whole line about recession doesn't affect films <laughs> doesn't age well, especially today. Now, of course, this scene, uh, this scene, this film has a phenomenal jump scare. It's kind of a jump scare. It's kind of not. I mean, it's set up like one with the guy in the bag. What a great scene that is. And when uh, Knight over at the Nightwatch Zone was doing his top uh, 10 jump scares, I was hoping it would be on there. It was not. So if you ever see this night, I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> that audition. The bar that they're hanging out and drinking and talking and stuff about his ideal woman, like who he would want. And it's pretty much just like his, his wife who passed away. But he said like somebody, you know, young, but like has accomplishments, like possibly plays piano or like something, sings or dances, like things like that. The bar is gorgeous. <laughs> like the whole granite countertop and everything and the, the wood, uh, Little mini closets with the all the wine bottles and liquor in the back. Just an observation. It's fucking gorgeous. And the dialogue is great. And that's another thing with foreign horror. Particularly, I find also with Japanese horror, or at least Asian horror in general, they don't spoon-feed anything to the audience. So the dialogue feels a lot more natural. Like, when you just have two characters having a conversation, and sure, it could add to it that they're speaking Japanese, like they're speaking a different language, so it's going to sound, you're not understanding it fully, you're reading the words that they're saying, so maybe there's a separation there a little bit, 
But I feel like the dialogue in Japanese horror is very authentic. Like, in, in good films, you know, not going to be wrong, there's a ton of shit ones, just like in any other country. But I feel like they do very well with dialogue. Like, they don't have to over-explain things, there's not as much exposition, like, you still get some here and there, but it's a movie. It doesn't feel as scripted as a lot of American horror films. Like, especially from, like, you know, like the ni- late 90s to today. The dialogue doesn't feel like s- you can tell someone is in the back, in the writer's room, writing these lines. It just feels more natural to me. And I love that about a lot of these films. Which I guess makes sense, because I've noticed when I'm talking Japanese films or... Italian horror films, for the most part, unless they're schlocky and campy and they're supposed to be, I don't tear apart the dialogue. (laughs) Like, anywhere near what I do with regular, like, American horror films. There's just not as much stupidity in here. So I just, I can't tear it apart as much. I mean, there's still stupid shit in these movies, don't get me wrong. But not as much that I've noticed doing this. Plus, when it comes to Italian horror, you just... You know, if you're an Italian horror fan, you know, after a little bit, your brain turns off to the dubbing, and you don't even pay attention to the acting in Italian horror, for the most part. Like, there's a few, few, few exceptions, but most of the time, you just accept the dubbing for what it is and say, yeah, whatever, it's Italian dubbing, and th- and you move on. Other films, though, like, dialogue is very, very important, for me especially, and I hate when it feels too scripted when if when there's dumb lines written in for no reason when you get like a whole monologue of exposition from a character like you don't need to be hand you know spoon fed anything or have your hand held and i like that some directors and other countries that make horror films respect that because (laughs) some of the movies that come out that just they think we're stupid and that we can't follow a simple film. I also really like here how they show like the flashbacks of uh, Shigeharu, right? That's his name, <laughs> and his wife and Shigehiko's, um, whatever, whatever I call them, you know what they are from now on. The mother and stuff who passed away. I like how they show the flashbacks of that because it makes you care about these characters. Like it makes you care about Shigeharu. It does. And same with the son. Like, not as much. He's not in this movie as much. But when you get to the end and you see this guy getting tortured, oh, man, like, you feel the pain coming through the screen. Like, with each little tick 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 oh, it, oh, it's hard to watch. It is. And she's a pretty girl, Masami. Personally, I've never been to in, into Asian chicks, but, I mean, to each their own. But she's a pretty girl. Like, I guess you could see this romance happening. I mean, even though it's not really a romance from one side, but the first time you see this, you don't know what to expect. So you could see it's believable. Like, yeah, he's a lot older than her, but so what? Like, it's just, age is just a number, as they say. So that's it's believable, too. But when he reads, like, when he's going over her application, and he's reading, it says, like, she's, like, worked for a music producer or something like that so that fits into what he was saying about his ideal woman and stuff like maybe play piano or something which i think is beautiful that she's using like a piano even if it's not a piano wire to raise a wire or something like that but it's like a piano wire so for me that's cool <laughs> that it, it works for me it links but when he's reading that and then he starts reading her letter like what she wrote down that you could see already how amazing this woman is at bullshit and manipulating and we know she's crazy from the start like it's not like they have a falling out and she goes nuts no she she's killed before like she's a she's a cold-blooded killer this woman and so she knows everything to say every perfect little way to word things to tug on emotional heartstrings and all of that's displayed beautifully in the letter that he's reading. Like, you, know, you hear him reading it. You know what I'm talking about. See, and this is what I'm saying earlier. How Mike is just great at just... the word I'm looking for? Like, diverting your expectations here. Because the whole audition process is hilarious. 
and you just have the comic music playing in the background. Like, it's very just cheery. It's bonkers. Like, <laughs> this is when you start thinking, wait, is this a horror movie? Like, am I sure I've got the right movie here? And I think that's excellent. Just to, like I said, the way that it just evolves into just true torture and, and pain and suffering and horror. And another great thing about this is that this shit could happen. This shit happens. <laughs> like, that's my type of horror. Like, psychological horror and just where it's pretty true to life, like where it could happen here. Like, this is just a crazy bitch who wants to who wants to kill because she feels like nobody can love her and only her. So she just is not living in reality. She's a fucking killer. And she's good at what she does. She's good at lying. She's good at acting. She's good at putting a performance on. That happens all the time in life, and you can end up in this situation somehow. And that scares me more than any monster or creature feature or anything like that in horror. Slashers that are invincible. No. This type of stuff here, this is what scares the hell out of me. But despite everything I just said about how great it is diverting your expectations and making it all comical during the audition process, blah, blah, blah. As soon as Asami sits down, everybody is thinking, like, all right, what's wrong with this crazy bitch? Like, <laughs> did anybody not think that this woman was crazy? Did anyone think this person was normal when they first saw this film? Again, I mean, you know it's a horror film, but if you don't know it's a horror film, it's still, like, it's right in your face that something's wrong with this bitch. And that's right, his friend even says it. <laughs> like, right after the audition when she leaves. He says, like, I can't put my finger on it, but something wrong with her. Alright, good, we got an intelligent person there. I love when Asami and Shigaharu are arranging like to hang out like to meet up for the first time on the phone after the audition and he goes to write like her information down and they have a close-up shot of his wife who passed away that's great for some reason i really like that they threw that that little shot in there so then shigaharu gets the call from uh somebody <laughs> some other guy and ends up telling him that on her uh, resume saying that she worked for, like, some record company, like Ace Records or something like that, that the person that she put down as a reference has been missing for 18 months, and he just disappeared. So this is how we know that this girl has killed before. Like, this isn't some first-time crazy snapping of her mind. She's killed before, and then we find out, I'm pretty sure, yeah, the guy in the sack is the second person that we know of. Forget if they mention another victim or anything like that. Let's see. The cinematography is gorgeous in this film, by the way. Sound design also. They play golf in Japan? So, Shigeharu's already got one red flag. This, well, let's call it one and a half, because of his friend who said that I've, something's wrong with her. Like, I have a weird feeling. So, that's a half. And then we got a full one here <laughs> that the person she put down is her reference on her resume has been missing, just poof, vanished 18 months ago, and never turned back up. So, big red flag, he chooses to ignore this, though. And, again, like, in, in some other types of movies that would try to write this way, there'd be some stupid reason that he, they ignore this red flag, or the red flag would be too big, and it would be like, why is this person, like, still even considering this? Here, it's fine. So It's just her employer went missing. No one's going to think that this young woman murdered her, her employer and got away with it. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, so it's not like that's where his mind's jumping to. So it's not that big of a red flag. It, it, it is for us as the viewer because we kind of know what to anticipate or we're trying to piece it out your first time watching this. But it's not that big of a deal. It's just like, all right, she works for this guy, and you went missing. And if anything, if it's bothering him that much, you can ask her, and she'll just make up some bullshit story. So it works. It's not like this huge thing that's like, oh, my God, how is this guy still thinking that this woman's, like, fine to see or to be around or anything like that? I like how they handle that here. And she's a great actress. 
Asami as a character acting as you know an innocent person and the woman who plays her as an actress. Great performance. And then, after what seems like a very short ass amount of time, he talks to his son and says, you know, I'm going to ask her to marry me. I mean, hey, anything could happen, but it seems like it's been a few days. <laughs> like, that's all it seems. Did I miss a jumps ahead, like, cue card or something that popped up? I don't think so. So, I don't know how much time has gone by since they met each other. So then, right before they fuck, they end up, <laughs> she ends up saying, love me and nobody else. And then when he breaks that, I mean, not really. I mean, this woman's insane. But then that's when she snaps and tries to kill this guy. But maybe I'll save this for the end. Whatever. Now, do you guys think that she actually loves him? And then when she feels like his love for her and only her is being threatened... Then she snaps, and that's when she tries to kill him and ends up torturing him and everything. I don't know what to think about that. I'm, that's why I said I'll save her for the end, but keep that in mind. Does she really love him? And Because we know that she's killed before, and we, she has Sackboy <laughs> in her apartment. Did she feel the same way for the people she killed in the past? Like, was she really obsessed with them and loved them or thought that, you know, whatever her version of love is, psychotic version, and then when things didn't go the way that she wanted, she ends up snapping and killing them? Or is this whole thing like a spider leading a fly to its web? Is this all premeditated? Is this all calculated? Is she just a cold-blooded killer? with no emotion involved, and she is just going from person to person and luring them in and then murdering them. Let me know what you think, because I've always debated that about this movie. Then after spending the night, he wakes up, and she's gone. <laughs> she has disappeared off the face of the earth. He can't contact her, he can't find her, and then they try to track down through her resume again, but it, it's all dead ends. It's all bullshit for the most part. And then they find out about the missing guy who's missing, what, three fingers and his ear and something like that, and that's who she has in the sack. Again, awesome scene. So a little bit earlier, we see, like, before they fuck in bed, he sees the burn marks on her, like, the inside of her thighs, like, on her, and he asks whatever, and she gives him whatever story, but then he goes and tracks down this old guy who, who is this? I don't think they ever specifically state who it is, but I'm guessing it's, I don't think it's her father, but maybe an uncle, or, like, a cousin, or, like, somebody who knew her when she was young, Asami, because they show the flashback of him burning her, and fucking torturing her. So, it has to be someone that she knew. And usually when people are abused and stuff, like it's usually somebody close to them. So I'm guessing it's a family member or a friend of the family, but I don't think they ever explain it. If, if they do and I missed it, somebody let me know, because I've never known who that is exactly. But the way that Mike films that whole scene and the creepy ass score coming in when he's saying all the lines like did, did you make love to her like did you t smell her did you touch her body and all of that and he's in the wheelchair with the prosthetic legs on like all of that is it's fantastic and then we get some cool first person uh, point of view of Asami breaking into the house when the maid I think it is when she leaves and she ends up seeing the picture of Shigaharu's wife who passed away, and she obviously gets pissed <laughs> and ends up drugging his uh, brandy or liquor, whatever that is. The lighting and the color palette used in some of the scenes here, excellent. Like, such a beautiful film, man. And I can definitely see people saying that this movie's boring. Like, 100%. Could definitely see that. I don't agree at all. Like, every time I watch this movie, it's not often... But every time I do, I am completely engrossed the entire two hours, or just about. I love the characters. I love the acting. I love the cinematography. I love the slow build to just horrific things. <laughs> and just everything. The score, everything about this film is, is, is amazing. 
but I can definitely see people saying not much happens or it doesn't turn into a horror movie until an hour and a half. Yeah, sure. Like, I can see that, and I respect that opinion, but definitely disagree. All right, let me tell you why I think this is an excellent jump scare with the, you know, when Shigahara is in the apartment and he, the the sack boy, sack person. <laughs> it's not so much the scare because you know what's coming. You you see the scene. And she feeds this guy fucking vomit, man. It's so gross. Like, I don't know what it is with the Japanese, man. Like, you guys over there, what is it with, with vomit and tentacle porn? Like, we're all weird in our own ways, but trust me, we didn't invent that shit. But the way that it builds and you know that it that sack is going to move, it's just the way that it builds up to it. And then it does give you a little bit of a jump. <laughs> but the real horror is when it finally comes out of the sack. And you see the fingers missing. And you see the legs cut off, you know, at the knees. That's when it really is effective. And it's not your traditional jump scare. That's why I said earlier, like, I don't know whether to call it, like, a full-on jump scare. But the, the whole scene with the, him eating the puke is so fucking gross, man. The whole blue lighting and everything about the scene when she's with the guy who tortured her as a young girl and the guy with the prosthetic legs that I'm assuming she cut off when she puts the wire around his neck and the whole dialogue from her saying that this, you know, this wire can cut easily through bone. And then he says, you're beautiful as she's strangling with strangling him. And then finally just like starts yanking at it until his head just falls right off, man. <laughs> and there's the great visual imagery, like other scenes that are interspliced into that, that like hallucinations, I'm, I'm guessing that Shigaharu seeing all of that is directed phenomenally. And Shigaharu drinks his drink, and he ends up getting paralyzed from the drug that she put in earlier. And now, shit hits the fan. <laughs> Completely. Aw, she killed the poor dog, too. And let's just say this. The whole look of her, Asami, in the ending torture scene here, with the white outfit, with the black apron, the black gloves, absolutely iconic. <laughs> what a great look for her in, in this whole just build up scene here this infamous scene she looks so good i'd argue that sh this is probably one of the most iconic characters villains in a japanese horror film and of course this film was a big part of inspiring eli roth for an especially with hostile and hostile 2 i mean i'm sure you could see that influence cited this as a huge influence as well as so many other directors and horror filmmakers that this movie is just like a top for them and I can absolutely see why, because the tension is off the wall in the last 20, 25 minutes of this movie. Just And she she sticks the big-ass needle into his tongue, and she says that it's going to make your, like, your extra sensitive to pain. And he's paralyzed, and he can't move. Oh, this guy, man, he does not deserve anything near close to this. And again, the long shots throughout this movie but in this scene too it's just it works so well it's so effective it's not cuts all over the place it's just long shots of her sticking these needles into him and she's saying deeper right with the chicken -dick -dick, isn't it deeper like and then she just keeps sticking the needles in that oh man you feel this guy's pain right through the screen the needles through the eyes man oh does this bitch know what i would do if I got out of this situation alive, <laughs> she has no idea. If I was able, if I somehow got out of this, do you know how dead this woman would be? <laughs> I would, I would draw it out for months. In fact, what you do is, you you grab her, you chain her up somewhere in a dungeon, <laughs> and for the 365 days of a year, you put a pin and needle deep inside one part of her body. For each day, and you go 365 till she's just a pin cushion. Uh, then you cut the ropes and you let her fall forward like a Mortal Kombat fatality. <laughs> That's what you do to this girl. But Asami, man, she comes prepared. She comes ready to party. She comes with her piano wire or whatever and says the same thing. I love how she says the same line that she said to the, the old pervert. 
whoever he is that uh, cuts through through bone so easily. Uh, then she just starts sawing his leg off, man, and it it looks fantastic. And she comes, like I said, she comes right at a party. She comes with even like cuffs for his feet that like have like pressure locks on them so that he can't move his legs at all. Like she's done this. It has to be more than two, three times. Well, technically, it's just, it's just fun from, like, the ankle down. But still, it sucks. <laughs> and then my whole thing earlier about if you get away and stuff, that all goes out the window if it gets to this point in real life. And mutilating your foot, the, the gore looks fantastic. <laughs> like, the effects look so good. And the way that she's just, like, smiling and, like, laughing and she's giddy. She's like, ha, ha, ha. Fantastic. Her performance, like I said, is, is amazing in this. And then we get this great shot, like, from outside, looking through the glass door, and she's finally, like, cuts the rest of his, like, his foot totally off, and she just chucks it at the glass door, and the blood hits on it. That's a great shot. That's hysterical. It's the only little thing I could fault here. The son comes home, and then he sees the father on the floor, missing his leg with pins and needles inside of him, and he just goes, Dad, what, what's wrong? What happened? What happened? Come on, man. He didn't trip and fall. His fucking foot's missing. That I don't know. That's stupid. But then he wakes up, Shigeharu, and we think it's a dream. And then he's back on the night that they made love. And she, he you know, promised all his love to only her. And he thinks that all this was just a crazy dream he had. And then, of course, it's not. And he comes to, on the floor, after his son got attacked by uh, Asami, she ends up chasing Shigehiko up the stairs and macing him in the face, and then she, he ends up kicking her ass down the stairs. She breaks her neck, and Shigeharu is still on the ground, still has the needles in. I know he's paralyzed, yeah, but the son, he comes over again. He just looks at his dad on the floor. He's like, Dad, you all right? <laughs> He says, call the cops. First thing for me, can you please pull these spikes out of my fucking face? Like, I don't know. Not his priority, I guess. He wants the cops here. And then he's just staring at Asami dying from her broken neck. She starts going on and reciting about, like, you accepted me for who I am. Like, I never thought I'd see you again. And this guy is, like, replying and saying, like, you'll find that one day that life is good or happy. you'll find happiness. Dude, this guy's talking to this woman after he just got his foot severed and was tortured by this bitch. He cares about anything she has to say? Come on, man. I mean, that's a little stupid. But all in all, amazing movie. Absolute classic. And just disturbing. Like, because this shit can happen. I mean, I was just watching recently, maybe a month ago or so, the on, uh, I want to say Tubi, they have a documentary on uh, Gabby Polito, whatever, the social media girl who went missing cross-country with her, her boyfriend, and how amazing their relationship seemed, and then before you know it, this guy fucking killed her. This shit happens. Well, you could think you, find the lo- you found the love of your life, and they murder you. So, that's Audition, <laughs> 1999, Takashi Miike, great stuff. It's not that late, I'll try to get Ringu Spiral up tonight, just since it's, they were so close. If not, second place comes tomorrow. Take care, guys. Mm-hmm.